Hello, I am Stephen Brown, Director of Preventive Emergency Medicine at the University of Illinois Hospital, an academic medical center located on the west side of Chicago. I will be speaking today about the Better Health Through Housing program. In this program, the University of Illinois pays for the housing of chronically homeless patients who frequent our emergency room. It has yielded a number of valuable lessons that I will be sharing with you today. So why would a hospital pay for housing? In 2015, we partnered with the Center for Housing and Health, a homeless advocacy agency that had built a deep network of supportive housing providers. We are a public hospital and we have a strong health equity mission. And the Affordable Care Act encourages hospitals to think about caring for the health of the communities where they are embedded, not just individuals that come to their hospital. This was our baby step into population health. Our point in time count in Chicago has been creeping down, but it's in January, the coldest month of the year, so there is undoubtedly an undercount. And if you read the news reports this previous winter, we had a polar vo vortex uh, during the count where temperatures hit 25 below. What hasn't budged is the number of unsheltered homeless, about 1,500. Our city relies on high barrier shelters, one with a daily sentence of between six to 800 clients. Consequently, we have patients with severe mental illness or opioid use disorders who have been banned from our most crisis shelters. You can't put the severely mentally ill into crowded conditions or expect a heroin user not to use. They'll just get dope sick. Without any other options, they sleep on the streets so they come to the emergency room. We had one lady last year who had accumulated 140 uh, visits to our emergency room. The credit for this program belongs to the Center for Housing and Health. They have agreements with 27 supportive housing agencies, three single room occupancy hotels, and an outreach worker. The network gives our patient access to over 4,000 apartments scattered throughout the city. This housing first model respects the right to self-determination for our patients by giving them choice. We pay the center $1,000 per member per month. I'm going to glide over the slide other than to say we have a solid process for identifying, screening, and transitioning patients into permanent supportive housing. We use a panel format because the cases are ethically complicated and medically challenging. The University of Illinois is now providing technical assistance to five other hospitals in the Chicagoland region. And the University of Illinois has just been asked by a large insurance company to locate their patients and guide them into our program. This insurance company will contribute funds to the flexible housing pool, which I will describe later. So what were the outcomes? We placed 26 patients in our first cohort into permanent supportive housing. Our retention rate, 47%, was lower than other Housing First programs, we think because we are ER-based and we had many who are unsheltered. Subsequent studies here at UI Health or University of Illinois for our most frequent ER patients with severe mental illness have found 48% to be homeless with 70% having a co-occurring substance use disorder. This is a very complicated sick po population. Our cost reduction was 21%, a 57% drop in hospital admissions and a 67% drop in ED use. Uh, You'll notice that uh, the asterisk next to the 21%. We had one outlier who was in palliative care at the time that we did this study. And if that person's uh, costs were removed, the cost savings were actually, or I should say, cost reduction was 67%. So what did we learn? Number one, lesson number one, homeless is a dangerous health condition. The life expectancy is 27 years less than the average American. In our first cohort of patients, our mortality rate was 30%. Four of six of the women in the program died. And nationally, we know that 15% die by drug overdose, 16% by head and neck cancers, another 15% by cardiovascular disease, including endocarditis, a complication of heroin use. 40% have been assaulted in the previous year, 21% of women have been sexually assaulted in the previous year, and 34% report at least one suicide attempt. The homeless have a rate of ED, uh, excuse me, ER utilization that is eight times other patients. 
an excess cost of 2560 per hospital admission, 2.3 days longer length of stay, and strikingly higher readmission rates, 51 versus 19%. If someone comes in with a life-threatening illness, we will do everything we can to save that person's life and address their injury or condition. Yet with homelessness, which has the same age-related mortality rate as some cancers and chronic conditions, we will discharge them back to the street. Lesson number two, the homeless are invisible in healthcare. In 2015, only 48 patients had been identified by ER staff. It is dramatically underdiagnosed. You may find it in a physician's note, but otherwise it is significantly undercounted. The best way to determine a patient's housing status is to look what street address they list. We now have evidence here in data that since 2000 time, excuse me, 2010, there have been 5,100 homeless patients, and that in 2018, we had 1,200 come through our doors, most of them unnoticed. Lesson number three. The homeless have exorbitant cost in utilization. In fiscal year 2018, we looked at the cost of the 1,200 homeless patients I mentioned earlier. We found that 40% have reimbursable healthcare costs that range from 1.53 to, to 160 times higher than our average patient's annual healthcare costs. And that within this cohort, 10% were uninsured and the hospital lost $1.2 million for their care. So consider this, the supportive house, supportive house, excuse me, the cost of supportive housing is about $57 a day. An ER bed costs $12.50. One night in a hospital will cost between $25 and $3,500. Arguably, you could put up a homeless person in a luxury hotel for $6.25 a night and still save money. Because we haven't aligned our silos between shelter systems, supportive housing, the criminal justice system, healthcare, and first responders, we have this insane system that shifts all the responsibility to healthcare, the most expensive beds in town. So why is this? Why haven't we solved this problem? This is a classic example of what we call the wrong pockets problem. Siloed systems cause cost shifting to the most expensive resources. One hospital admission is 44 times more expensive than paying for 30 days in supportive housing. But the University of Illinois Hospital is not paid for the cost of this program. We absorb this in our general operating budget. Yet we help shift the cost back to housing and supports. Uh, and Medicaid, Medicare and insurance companies clearly benefit from the program by reducing the cost and utilization of healthcare services. We need pairs to join this conversation. So lesson number four, collective impact among hospitals and, and insurance companies. At the University of Illinois, we are calling homelessness a dangerous health condition. It will take collective impact, everyone pitching in to reduce the health and disease burden. We're seeing this begin to emerge. In Portland, for example, 10 house hospitals have committed 21 million to build more affordable housing. In Chicago, we're replicating LA's flexible housing pool. Beyond providing supportive housing, it also creates capacity for more housing. The city and the county, along with the Center for Housing and Health, hospitals and insurance companies and philanthropy have banded together to create the pool, where all funded is braided together. When fully funded, it will bring 750 more supportive housing units online. Lesson number four, collective impact via upstream alignment with other pu public sector systems. I hope the irony of my title, Preventive Emergency Medicine, has not been lost on those of you in healthcare. Our traditional model in emergency medicine has been Greek treat and street. It's an absolute necessity because we're overcrowded and we don't know if the next person is a stub toe or a massive stroke. But we are beginning to work with the mental health courts using assisted outpatient treatment for those mentally ill patients who are unable to care for themselves. We are also creating the capacity to do street or ER-based suboxone induction using medication-assisted therapy. Our sheriff's department here has created a diversion unit. And we'll transport those seeking treatment to our emergency room to a, uh, or a walk-in clinic. But here's what healthcare needs from housers. Our program's retention rate did not match other housing first projects, 47 versus 
The emergency room sees more in shelter patients with severe and persistent mental illness and substance abuse. Housing was limited to level two and some, but not enough level three with assertive community treatment. Uh, this is no uh, hard and fast model. This is a straw man to that we are now hammering out in Chicago between healthcare and housing. Housing and supports need to match the acuity of the patients. This is what healthcare needs from you. We need a tiered approach. So that's the end of my presentation. We need to reframe chronic homelessness as a dangerous health condition and address it as we would any other acute medical condition. We need to proactively seek out those at risk for homelessness or who are currently homeless. We need to realign payment, embrace a collective impact approach, and align with unlikely allies in criminal justice and first responder systems. Thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to answer any inquiries you may have by sending me an email listed on this slide. Thanks again.